I'm Erin from Scottish Cycling's Young People's Panel and today I'm talking to the lovely Kerry about Women in Girls Week and really just getting an idea of what her cycling career has been like so far. So let's get started. So Kerry, um, so far I've just written a few questions out that um, if you could just answer um, whatever way you like, how long ever you take. Um, so yeah, the first question is how long exactly have you been involved in cycling? Uh, so I got involved in cycling in 2013, so it'll be about seven years now that I've been um, cycling, a little bit longer. Um, I did do a bit of triathlon before that, but I keep that on the down low. <laughs> so cycling for seven years. Perfect. Wow. Um, yeah, that's about the same amount of time I have actually been cycling for as well. So. So question two is, what disciplines do you mainly race in and how many females are in that discipline? Like roughly. Okay, so I race mountain bikes. I've done a little bit of road and I do cycle cross in the, the winter as well. Um, in Scotland, there's quite a lot of female, female cycle cross riders. There can be, I think we've had probably about 50 before in, in a race. Wow, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, mountain biking, not so much at all. I've raced mm -hmm. elite level mountain bike here in Scotland and only had three people in, in a race. In the British series, yeah. we can have between 20 and 30. So there's certainly not as much depth. But in cyclocross, it's amazing to see so many people yeah. get involved. And I'm hoping that mountain bike will go that way as well. I think there's yeah. a bit of a fear element there with people. Um, but we need to keep being advocates for our, for our disciplines and hope yeah we, we do yeah so why do you think that is why do you think that there's more people in cyclocross than there is in mountain biking I think cyclocross is a lot more accessible the equipment for a start is a lot more straightforward even though you could argue yeah. that most people need two bikes but most people don't ride two bikes I don't, I don't yeah. have two the one so the equipment's quite straightforward and it's transferable as well you can ride your cyclocross bike on the road and the races are 40 minutes, so it's not too overwhelming. And you know what to expect technically. You know that the worst you're going to get is maybe some steps or routes or yeah. um, some hurdles. Whereas yeah. a mountain bike, very unpredictable. So mm -hmm. you don't know how technical it's going to be. It might be an hour and a half to two hours long. The equipment yeah. is a little bit more challenging. Do you go mm -hmm. suspension at the front and a shock? And it's just yeah. a little more overwhelming for people. And I think yeah. that there's a bit of a, a, a barrier there in that respect. But like cyclocross, once you try it, you realize that it's not probably as, as scary or, or as bad as you, you, yeah. you thought it might be. And I do know that the SXC in, in Scotland are doing a lot to encourage people to get involved in the sport, do te tester sessions sessions for teenagers and yeah uh, so there's a lot being done to try and grow mountain biking which is great yeah I think another thing to consider as well is the fact that Scottish Cycling has like introduced the A lines and B lines as well which has really made a big difference for people's confidence especially in the women's um yeah and make, making it just a little bit more accessible for newcomers or people who just haven't got enough confidence um yet but are building on it yeah, Perfect. absolutely. Right. So question three, um, what are the main barriers that you think women face in cycling are? Oh, <laughs> where do you start? Yeah, um, oh no. So I always, so when I left school, I trained to be a PE teacher and I always wondered to myself, am I the best person to be a PE teacher? Because I love sport. Therefore, can I see it from the perspective of someone who doesn't? Yeah. And your perspective can be skewed in that respect. And I sometimes wonder that about cycling. When you're so engrossed in the sport and you love it, do you have mm -hmm. the ability to step back and actually appreciate the things that are barriers for people? And I'm not sure that we always can be. However, I'm always willing to listen to people and, and, and find out what these barriers are. And I guess if we look at it from the current climate that we're in, equality is a huge huge argument at the minute and when we look at cycling on a grander scale um world tours um hill climbs in the uk there's a massive disparity between how women are treated in the media and financially compared to men and that i think is a subconscious bias subconscious mm -hmm. 
kind of barrier for, for a lot of women on a on a smaller scale I guess it is that it that traditionally cycling has been a more male dominant sport and it's just about progressing it by by maintaining or opening the door to more women to get into the sport and you've got to see it to be it don't you so yeah. um the more women you see in the sport the more the more women you'll have in the sport um <laughs> that's a very kind of light touch touch on on the barrier yeah. for women um i think we could go down a rabbit hole oh um, you really could but... there is there's so many things and for different age groups as well for for younger people it's it's there's different barriers to maybe an older person so yeah mm -hmm. definitely something that we need to look into and improve mm -hmm. so question four is how have you ever overcome some of these barriers personally uh it's a really difficult one because some stuff stays with me so a big barrier i have found in my career as a cyclist has been by way of the fact that I started the sport quite late. So I was kind of mid twenties when I really started cycling properly. And I've been, I ha I've had it say to me, your age precludes you from X, Y, or Z. And that's a really, really difficult thing to, to hear, particularly because I very firmly believe that there's a huge difference between chronological age of a rider and a developmental age of a rider. So you and I have been riding bikes for the same length of time. So developmentally, yeah. we're probably very similar stages, even though I've yeah. had a lot more racing experience now. Yeah, yeah. But chronologically, I'm a lot older than you. And it's really difficult <laughs> when that barrier is put in front of you as something very black and white, but it's not at all. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I've ever, ever been able to overcome it other than just use my legs to, to try and make the point that age shouldn't be yeah. so clear. Um, mm. And I think it's something I find placed more heavily on women as well, despite women proving that they get better with age too. Yeah. So I'm not sure how or if that's something I've been able to overcome because it's always stayed with me and it's always yeah. something in the back of my mind. And it, I think it makes me rush things well and try and do things very quickly rather than just step back and do things at my own pace. Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm not entirely sure. The barrier for participation hasn't been a difficult one for me because I am the type of person that will just try things and I actually don't mind failing. I don't mind when things go yeah. wrong because I know that it's not it might might have gone wrong but it's a good valuable lesson for going forward but as I understand that a lot of other people don't feel like that and they're scared to fail or things go wrong so yeah I'm not sure if I'm the best person to address barriers other than just encourage someone just to yeah never see something as a failure just see it as a lesson yeah I think that's a really really good attitude to have towards the situation as well yeah Perfect. So for question five, I've put, who has, who's been a positive role model for you in cycling? Um, the people that I have as role models in my life are day-to-day -day people. Um, and they ch my role model in sport and in cycling changes on a weekly basis based on who yeah. I'm following at that moment. So. I spent some time with Jenny Graham about three or four weeks ago and Jenny Graham cycled around the world, fastest yeah. woman to do so, is a massive advocate for getting more bums on saddles and more women cycling and was a really thing and I rode bikes with her in Harris and I left Harris just feeling so invigorated and excited about cycling and about life and about feeling positive and and it was really good and, and I think yeah like right now I'm still buzzing about that experience and I see her as a role model just that kind of just go and do it attitude just yeah just um do it but then respect that cycling isn't just about racing your bike fast it's about those interactions that you have with people. Continuing on um question six is are you part of a club and if so which one? I'm not part of a club actually. Well, I'm part of a Genesis bicycle club, but it's mm -hmm. 
worked an affiliated club and it's just kind of the the bike brand that I represent and the bike brand is very much about um, community and riding bikes and meeting people at races yeah. and doing stuff. So I'm not part of any of the sports cycling clubs just because I do a lot of my training on my own. And then when yeah. I do train with people, it's people within gravel or mountain biking. And most of the clubs in, in Scotland are geared more towards road, I would say, rather than- Yeah, just yeah. Yeah, that's my that's the same kind of problem I have as well is my local club is very, very much road orientated and that's not really where I my I sit. So I kind of choose to train on my own most of the time. Yeah. 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 So how is being part of um your like um not your club but your like your group um helped you like progress in cycling and like helped you through your like relationships like surrounded by cycling? Well, interestingly, actually, the Genesis Bicycle Club is a very new thing. So I haven't spent a lot of time riding with that club because it's UK wide. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, I did a lot of riding with um, Bella Club Edinburgh. And I would go out on the bunch with them on a Saturday morning. And that was a really good experience just because yeah. it was so hard. It was so, so hard. And there's a few bunch rides on a Saturday that I did not get around because it was just, they were just so strong. <laughs> And right now, it's not a club, but we've set up a training ride, a training group in Aberfoyle as well. We're just calling it the oh, typical cool. Wednesday Night Worlds. So that will be <laughs> on a mixture of travel bike and mountain bikes. And it'll just be me cool. and the guys going as fast as we can around some of the gravel in Aberfoyle. So <laughs> I don't think you necessarily have to have a structured club from which you draw your training. You can yeah. seek that out. Um, in your surroundings and around the people that you already spend time of bike, time on bikes with, and that's what yeah. I've done. And heading into the winter, that's that's kind of how I've, how I've shaped things. Yeah, perfect. Um, so my next question is about like facilities at racing events. So do you think that the facilities at events are adequate for females in regarding to changing and except like like changing etc. Um, yeah. Uh, that very much depends on what event you go to. Yeah. So, for instance, Five College um, mm -hmm. is excellent for changing facilities and I'm trying to think what else. There's a few other, like Knockburn Loch and places like that. Yeah. They've got fantastic changing facilities. But other places, just by way of the nature of the sport that we're involved in, it's a lot more challenging. So if you're mountain yeah. biking, you can be in quite a remote place. Mm -hmm. um, much like cycle clubs, so they're perhaps not ideal um, and I've never I've never really seen it as a, a bad thing just because of it's you know I, I'll go and drive somewhere and ride my bike and get absolutely filthy and then drive yeah. back again I wouldn't necessarily think I need yeah. to go for a shower there and then I'm not sure yeah, yeah I, I'm not sure if it's ever something I've thought about but on the whole, I don't think it's too bad. Yeah, yeah, no, I would agree with that, actually. Um, I think definitely some events are a lot more than better than others. Um, but it's something that can be improved. Um, but it's not the end of the world at the same time. Um, OK, so question 10 is what exactly got you into cycling? Was it a person or was it just, you know, you just felt like it one day? I was very, very competitive when I was younger. So I did a lot of running and I played basketball for Skolian Glitch in uh, Vimbekla, where I went to school in the Western Isles. Okay. I went to uni to train to be a PE teacher, but didn't really, like I played a lot of sports when I was at uni, but nothing that competitive. And it was just an accidental race that I did when I was maybe 23 or something. My friend had convinced me to buy a bike from a cycle bike. In, it, in, it, uh, in Sterling, it was this oversized, massive race bike from like the 1940s or something. It was huge. <laughs> we used to cycle to Sterling Uni, which was about four miles, because I worked there at the time. And then my long ride was cycling to Sterling Uni via Bridge of Allen, which is maybe like five and a half miles. <laughs> so, and we both Let's ended. Start Sorry? We've all got to start somewhere. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. And we both entered a novice triathlon in Bishop Briggs. I didn't even know what a triathlon was at that point. And I also didn't know that 
all the fast people were in the sprint distance and we were in the novice which was myself and my friend and a few older women and I won this novice triathlon and I had that taste for success again and I was like <laughs> I wonder what happened if I actually start training but mm. I was never ever good at swimming so yeah. that meant that every time I got out of the pool or the, the the sea I had to pedal as hard as I could to catch up with people <laughs> so I think that's how I got quite good at the bike um, and eventually <laughs> I entered a race I met just a night about race that went quite well and my triathlon coach was like I think you're in the wrong sport and I was pretty glad to get to stop, stop swimming to be honest yeah. so that's loosely how it happened that's the condensed version cool that sounds um very interesting <laughs> um right so question 11 is what has been your biggest achievement in your cycling career so far and one that is definitely going to grow oh definitely competing here at glasgow 2014 that like, that's unbeatable there's been loads mm -hmm. of little nuggets of really really cool stuff that's happened along the way but in terms of a competitive stage and its location in scotland that's without a doubt the best thing ever yeah 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 i i thought you'd say that to be honest i'd have been surprised if you didn't say that <laughs> okay so question 12 is what advice would you give to any women wanting to get into cycling um i think oh it sounds so simple but just 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 go for it just you can pick up a bike in a place like recycle bike or you can borrow a bike of people i'm not precious about my bikes at all and if people want to use my bikes i'm like take it because i want people to feel what i feel when yeah. i ride my bike and um, when i'm constantly <laughs> like do you want to borrow my bike do you want to borrow my bike so <laughs> there's always somebody i i truly believe that in everything we do in life there's an invisible hand somewhere helping you along the way and guiding you along the way we all have it I've had it all, the whole way through my cycling career just invisible hands people quietly helping you without you realizing and it's like yeah. that when, when you start cycling the people who are in cycling love cycling and love it when other yeah. people love it as well yeah so, so those are the, those are your advocates and the people you want to lean on when you're starting out just just try it like everyone loves feeling knowledgeable as well so when you're asking, yeah, definitely I can use my gears and what kit should I wear or you don't even need to wear a kit when you start out just put your shorts on and your jeans and just pedal your bike yeah definitely it kind of it just gets into your blood a little bit and you you slowly kind of I, I didn't know what a group set or how to use my gears when I first got on a bike and as you said earlier you know we all have to start somewhere so mm -hmm. just just go out give it a stab and, and don't be yeah. scared to ask for help either mm -hmm. Especially, I think that's a very good point for people who are who are in the sport and maybe have been in it for a wee while, but not for a desperately long time and are still a little bit struggling. Just ask somebody. Everyone mm. at events wants to help you. Um, you if anyone ever came up to me or I'm sure yourself, we would we would do everything in our power to help them because, you know, cycling is such a great sport. Mm -hmm. Totally. Cool. So uh, question 13 is what has it been like traveling around the world and getting to ride your bike? slash race your bike I still pinch myself about that so I see my bike as my passport to the world <laughs> and one of the very very first races I ever did abroad was in Basel in Switzerland oh, wow. and I went to the uh, pretty much on my own and I had to ask people to help me this is these random people in the pits can you take my jacket for me and can you look after my bottles and to date, I've done a lot of races on my own and pe people do largely help out. So I remember doing this race and I was so focused on the race um, that on Sunday morning when I woke up, my flight wasn't until like 7 p.m. that night. And I hadn't really thought about Basel or Switzerland or where I was. And I was like, oh, I'll just go to the airport. And I spent all day in the airport. And I was so, when I got back, I was like, what a waste of a trip. You went to this beautiful country, this beautiful city, and you sat in an airport all day because all you thought about was that race. And I resolved from that minute onward to never ever go to a place and not soak up the country, the culture, the food, the people, everything. So when I travel with my bike, I, I make a really big point of making sure that I 
immerse myself in, in where I am for a bit and yeah. you know, eat the food and spending time with the people so because race on the whole I would say like nine out of ten, ten races don't go well and you don't want to leave a country dwelling on that race experience you want to yeah. leave dwelling on the cool stuff that you did while you were there so yeah it, yeah so there's like for me that part of it is very um, important part of the kind of the racing but yeah. yeah and it's it's amazing I feel so fortunate every time I I go somewhere new yeah to to, to be able to experience that and it's because I ride and race bikes yeah no and I think it's amazing how cycling can open so many doors for people mm -hmm. um it really it really is Mm -hmm. cool now we're nearly there only a couple more questions um so obviously for the last few months we've been struggling with this horrible pandemic that everyone hates and is just wanting to get rid of um but how is it how has lockdown um impacted your cycling um and like what did you do to keep you going during the time so when lockdown first hit I actually I felt a big sigh of relief actually so I'm, I was busy with my work back and forth to Edinburgh and um I'd been having a hard time on the bike and I was like wow I can just step back and actually just work on the things that I need to work on on the bike and so forth and and that was really motivating for me um and I felt like I was training like because I'm not a full-time rider and all of a sudden I felt like I, I kind of was because we're so fortunate in Scotland that we've been able to get out and about and spend time in nature. Um, mm -hmm. So I did, I spent quite a lot of time on the bike and I got a new coat, or I got a coach at the start of lockdown and that was all fantastic. And it all went a little bit wrong when I picked up an injury just before a race, my first race, which was going to be in, in France. However, I'd been in two minds about whether to go or not in case I had to quarantine for two weeks and all this kind of stuff and as it happened yeah. I didn't go I would have had to have quarantined and after that that's when I really started to struggle with with quarantine and racing so a lot of my racing peers in Scotland have special exemptions because they're on governing bodies and so forth yeah. which I'm not, I'm not privy to. So it's, it was difficult, really difficult at first watching them go away and race, race at World Cups, race European Cups. That, that was really, really tough. Mm -hmm. But then again, I had to work really hard on myself and just realise that it's not just about racing. Bikes are about so much more. So I've spent the last couple of months just doing really cool adventures on my bike instead. Yeah. So fun stuff that I would never ordinarily do at this time of year because I'd be too busy racing. So, yeah. you know, like riding around Rannoch Moor and doing Coriolic Pass and yeah. uh, just really cool, fun adventures around Scotland, doing the Kieran Path, going around Ben Nevis on my bike and just amazing stuff like that. And that's really yeah. been so uplifting and such a, a change from from always having to feel like I need to focus on racing and it's been really good it's been really like it's still tough to know that your competitors are still racing in Europe whilst you can't however it's important to remember that you didn't get into bikes just to race them you got in for everything everything else surrounding them yeah. so on the whole it's been it's been okay yeah that's actually very similar to me as well I I struggled at the beginning of lockdown um but I remember that I had a bike and you know it provides great entertainment yeah. <laughs> so yeah um so the last question we're nearly done um is what is your goals for the future <laughs> are we are we capable of planning for the future right now when we don't know what's happening I'm not entirely <laughs> sure that, let's say your three-year plan what's your three-year plan so I, I don't feel done with racing yet. Um, I'm 34 now, but I still feel young in the sport. And lockdown has taught me that I still have a lot of improvements to make. It's been really cool just, you know, working with a parameter and a coach and watching, like being able to see PBs still. Um, 
Yeah. So yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't feel done with it. I'm still hungry to improve and hungry to kind of grow in the sport. And I guess it's just give myself two or three years more to see where it can take me or where I can take it. And um, yeah, and I want to be able to be the type of cyclist who can advocate for women in the sport, for Scottish women in sport, and for the sport as well. And you know, doing stuff like this is really cool. And speaking to people like you, Ed, and it's fantastic yeah. as well, just to see that there's there's this kind of thing, these kind of things going on. So being involved in that on that side of it as well is is, is very important to me. But in a competitive realm yeah I'm I'm not done with it there might be a bit of graveling as well because you know gravel's the next big thing so who knows <laughs> it does seem to be that way doesn't it <laughs> perfect right well yeah. that's me done all my questions um so yeah thank you very very much Kerry for taking the time to speak to us um it's been really lovely speaking to you um that's yeah fine. so that's all for today um I hope you get out on your bike and have some more adventures um and i'll speak to you soon great thanks very much erin thank you bye